guys. Well, uh, I'm excited to preach the word. Thank you again for uh, being with us this morning. And on many of our seats, you'll find our new campaign, which begins today. And it's the perfect campaign because it's called Seven. Amen? So feel free to take one home, and uh, we'll go through that in uh, more detail at leaders' meeting. If you're a member of the church, it's going to be very exciting. It's very straightforward, and there's lots of uh, tools and resources. It's not a campaign that will last for a week or two, but rather something that we'll be working on really um, over the period of our lives. Amen? Yeah. As long as we're alive. We're, our, really, our campaign is to make it to heaven, so this is going to help. Amen? Amen? So right now, we, uh, we'll turn our Bibles over to Luke chapter 16. And uh, we're in Luke 16 and Luke 17. We've been going through the book of Luke. Now, if today's sermon, if it hits you, if it convicts you, if it makes you feel all sorts of something, that's good, and that's from God. Amen. I didn't plan today to be at Luke 16 and Luke 17. That was God's plan, amen? amen. And the title of the lesson is The Values of God. Wow. What is God value? What's his value system? How does he determine value? Luke 15, excuse me, Luke 16, in verse 1. It says, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Point number one, faithful stewardship. What does God value? What does God want us to strive for in our lives? Faithful stewardship. Amen? So there's this parable, and in the parable, there's a rich man and there's a manager. And the rich man represents God, and we are represented by the manager. You know, before we became Christians, we wasted that which God had entrusted to our care. We squandered our talents and prostituted those things to the world. When we became Christians, when we became disciples, we're now called upon to use what we've been given to further advance God's cause and God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. Now, this guy, he was a bad manager. And the rich man comes and he says, you can't be manager any longer. You've ruined what I've given you. But then what he does is he goes out. He says, well, I've, I'm too old to get a new job. I'm too ashamed to beg. So I know what I'll do. I'll change the accounts of my clients. So he calls in his clients. He says, hey, here's what you should do. How much do you owe my master? He says, well, the one guy, you know, it's this amount. He says, well, have it. Lower it by half the amount. 50% reduction. I mean, anybody got any debt? Yeah. How would you feel if I lowered it by 50% today? Would that, would that encourage you? $30,000 in student loans? Make it 15. I mean, it's, I, I, that's, quite, that's quite generous. He calls in another guy and lowers it even further. And then he's commended by his master. This is kind of a confusing parable, but it's actually one of the most important parables for us to understand. What's the point? It says this guy used what he had at his disposal to make for himself friends. He says, after I've lost my job, I'm going to come back and, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to expect something in return. And when I knock on your door and you forget what I look like, remember when I halved or when I reduced your debt, can I stay over at your place for a while? Do you have any help that you can give me? Don't forget what I did for you. And the master says, wow, that was pretty shrewd. That was pretty smart. And he was commended. And then in verse 9, how does it apply to us? It says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What's the point? The way you actually spend your money, the way you, this is not a sermon about money, amen? amen. I just want to preface it. 
Jesus is talking right here. We're just relaying what Jesus is saying. The way you use what God has given you, and here it, it does zero in on your resources, your finances, determines where you end after you die. Come on. Wow. I mean, is that pretty important? Yeah. Where you end up after this, this life expires for you, where will you be when you die? Where will you spend your eternity? And it says here that for us, we want to be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So the point of the parable, this is why it's so important, is that we use our money, we use our finances, not for personal gain, but to make more disciples. Are you with me? Turn your Bibles over to 1 Timothy 6. We'll be coming back to Luke 16. So, you know, many Bibles have these little ribbons. You can put that ribbon in Luke 16. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to read a scripture here that's often been misquoted, but I think it's very important. 1 Timothy verse, chapter 6, verse 3. It says, If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. This is very important. The Bible says if you believe in a false doctrine, if you believe in a false teaching, even if that variance or that falsehood or that lie is slight, even if you're 99% accurate and 1% off, it's, it's not like, oh, that's, that's okay, that's acceptable. The Bible says that you're conceited and that you understand nothing. How important is it to know the truth and to have the right doctrine? Well, it's of, of great importance. You, we can't be conceited. We've got to be humble when the Bible is open. Amen? Amen. It goes on, and it says that, that in verse 4, he has an unhealthy interest. These are false teachers in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means of financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So, you know, it says, you know, money is the root of all evil. Well, actually, what it says is that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It says when you're eager to get rich, you wander from the faith and you pierce yourself with many griefs. Now, I'm not a millionaire. Amen. amen. And I never will be. <laughs> uh, I don't I, I, I'm not going to inherit a million dollars. My mom and dad are right there. Amen. Is there a, is there a secret uh, million dollars? I don't know about because it's not a secret million dollars. I don't know about. OK, uh, most of us are not. So most of us were not born what America would consider to be wealthy. OK, uh, most of us are not hedge fund, you know, uh, we, we, we're, we weren't born with a silver spoon in our mouth, comparatively speaking, in America. It says those that want to get rich. There are those that are born rich, okay? Amen. Maybe you just are inherently rich and, you know, there's just lots and lots and lots of money in your family, which is not a sin. Those of us that were not born that way, it says when you're eager to get rich, you'll wander from the faith and you'll pierce yourself with many griefs. Now, here's the reality, okay? I am a full-time minister for the Lord, amen? amen. Before I was uh, a, a full-time minister for the Lord, I was a full-time disciple for the Lord that had a job, amen? amen? Now, I still have a job, but but I had a secular job, and I had to, you know, essentially go punch a clock and receive and, and collect a check and, and pay my bills and everything like that. Uh, but I was, I was so committed and so devoted, and I was so eager to do as much as I could for God. I believed that I was called by God, and then I was trained in the ministry so that I could be full-time and, and do it full-time. Now, here's a reality. I'm not in it for the money, because there just isn't a whole lot of it. Amen? Uh, now, I say, well, if I wasn't in the ministry, I'm glad I'm in the ministry. I I'm glad I don't have a lot of money, because if I weren't even as a disciple, I could be drawn away by the temptation, eager to get rich. Now, now, I could make a million dollars. Again, this sermon is not about money. It's about your heart. Jesus talked a lot about money. And he really, he was addressing the, the core issue, your heart. And if you're upset with a sermon about money, it's because you love money. Amen? So this is all about what the scriptures are teaching. 
I could want to go make a million dollars. And you know what? I'm pretty, I'm pretty ambitious. I probably could. But what would I lose in that process? So much. I'd lose my relationship with God. I'd lose my faith. I'd be pierced with many griefs. You, you lose your family. You lose joy. You lose time. And at the end of your life, you can have a lot of money and look back and have nothing else of value in your life. It says you wander from the truth. It's the root of all kinds of evil. This, this eagerness to get rich will destroy your life. Look further in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verse 17. Command those who are rich. You see, it's not a sin to be rich. Amen. In this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. It says here that those that are rich should be generous, that they should not put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. You know, it's very interesting. If you, anybody got a dollar bill? Do you have one? Can I see it? Oh, wow. How much is this paper that this money is printed on worth? Not much. Can you eat this? Can you wear it? Can you do anything with it? What's the value of this other than, thank you, sis. What's the value of it other than what we've agreed upon? The global economy is literally something that everybody has said, hey, uh, there's some value that I'm going to assign to this, and we agree upon it. Well, it's backed by gold, Jared. Well, can you eat gold? No. Can you, well, I guess like, you know, some of those tacos, they have like gold leaves. So we're not talking about that kind of Can you wear gold? Can you use gold as a tool? No, what's really valuable? What's valuable in this life? It's surely not money. Now, if, the, if that economy decides to stop working and it's hanging on by a thread, what are we going to do? You could have millions in the bank account. And what's it worth? Not a thing. You know, my, when my wife and I were missionaries in Mexico City, I used to worry. They said, well, what's going to happen to the country? Is the country going to implode? I mean, is everything just going to collapse? And I came to the conviction that if for our purposes to evangelize the world in this generation, the United States of America needs to completely fall, in, fall apart and collapse, I'm okay with that. So be it. But if it needs to continue to prosper so that we can give our money to evangelize the world, then amen, that's why we're here to make it happen. And we lived in Mexico City. We realized the church there didn't have the funds and never would have the funds to evangelize not only that country, but all of Central America. So we decided to, to put our hope in God, not in wealth. To put our hope in God, not in the stock market. To put our hope in God, not in the economy. To know that no matter what happens, God will provide for his people. Amen? Amen. Now, it's not a sin to be rich. It says the way you use your money right. will determine how effective you are and then where you end when your life is over. You know, the first reason that God gives us money is to make more disciples. It's expensive to make a disciple. You got to buy them coffee. You got to drive to Brandon. They might be hungry because you, you tell them maybe they skipped work that day to do a Bible study. Like, well, let me buy you a sandwich. You know, it'll cost you time. When you study the Bible, we've been doing so many studies, and I've been up every morning, like hitting the door at 6:30 to go and do a study at 7:30. You say, man, this is this is time consuming. This is requiring a lot of my time. It's requiring a lot of everything. But that's exactly why we have it. Our time and our finances and all of our resources, our strength, should be used to advance God's kingdom. The second reason why we have money is that God tests our hearts with it. Look back at Luke 16. Verse 10. It says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
the Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. What does it look like when you sneer? It's like, it's like, that's not a good attitude. You know what I mean? Some of you look like you're sneering right now. Like, let's go to Luke 18. You know, can we just skip this part? It says, you know, he said to them in verse 15, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. You know, uh, in the religious world, there, that excuse, you hear it a lot. Well, God knows my heart. The only thing that would inspire you to say that is when you yourself know you're not obeying the Bible. So it's literally, you're, you're condemning yourself when you say, well, God knows my heart. Yeah, that's the problem. He knows your heart. That should scare the bejesus out of you. And you should get on your knees and pray and ask God to send you a disciple to teach you the word. Amen. That's, that's it. God does know your heart and he knows your actions. It says what's valued highly among men, highly among women, what's valued highly in America, in the Western world, is detestable to God. I mean, it makes him sick. He says you, you and I have different value systems. We think differently about what we have. You know, we've got our special missions contribution coming up. And I'm so encouraged by the Bible on the Bay Bible talk. They, they went out to the raise game and they started raising funds for special missions. And that's, that's the way to do it. We go and plunder the Egyptians. Amen. And we've got to make sure that we're being faithful, making every effort to make disciples. You know, the American dream breeds entitlement. We feel entitled to a retirement. We feel entitled to a vacation. We feel entitled to a nice car. We feel entitled to two cars. We feel entitled to a whole bunch of stuff. It's a special missions. Our devotion to God can cut into those things. They're actually in direct conflict with each other. You, you can't have two masters. You only have one. Like, you can't love, you know, like I have one wife. Amen? Amen. I say, babe, I love you. And that's it. <laughs> There's nothing else. See, you can't have a divided heart. And God expects your entire heart, your whole being, you cannot serve both money and God. How faithful are you as a steward of God's money? You know, the, the things that God gives you are not your own, but they really belong to him. He's given you those things to test your heart. Even Deuteronomy chapter 8, let's go there. It's in the Old Testament, amen? Deuteronomy chapter 8, this is just too good of a passage to simply refer to. And it says, in verse 10, when you've eaten and are satisfied. So, okay, what are we talking about here? The Egyptians, the Jews had been freed from Egypt. Similar to when before we were Christians, we were freed from our slavery to sin and we were saved. It says, after that's happened, when you've eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known to humble and to test you, so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your, father, your forefathers, as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations the Lord destroyed before you. So you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. The Bible says that you must remember when you were young and when you were freed from your slavery. You remember when you first became a disciple? Yeah. And you were just so excited. You didn't care about anything. I mean, you were just so filled with gratitude because you were a slave. Then you were set free. And all that mattered was your freedom. But then after you've eaten and are satisfied, after it's been a, a bit of time and maybe you've, uh -oh. you've gotten yourself a, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe you got yourself, 
a husband or a wife, and it's great to have. I thought Marley and Christine might, might have placed membership in the church in Mexico, amen, but they're back with us, amen. It's great to have you guys back. See, maybe you've gotten yourself a, a, a nice uh, job, and, and you're, you've built up your family, and everything is good. He says, do not forget. Because when it was awesome, you didn't have anything. But God gave you water out of a rock. Wow. And wasn't that glorious? You stood back and said, wow. But when you have your own water, you don't get to see awesome things like that anymore. He said, God gave you bread. He fed you with manna. It just literally, I don't know how it's happening. It's, oh, it's tasty, you know. It's like, but now you've got your own resources. Do not forget that even the ability to go and work comes from God. You know, as disciples, we might not have very much here, but when we die, we'll be accepted and welcomed into eternal heavenly dwellings. And that's why we do everything that we do. Faithful stewardship. Point number two, a benevolent spirit. Go back to Luke 16. Luke 16. You know, it says in verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a, be a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. And send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. Well, Lazarus received bad things, but now he's comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, Send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. You know, right here, the Bible doesn't say that this is a parable. Jesus simply relays this story wow. that happened. And the rich man says he was dressed in purple, and he lived in luxury every day of his life. And the fact that he was dressed in purple denotes two things, that he was royal and that he was religious. It says every day he walked by this guy, and every day he feasted, the rich man. You know, in the Greek, the word that's translated as feasted is uh, gourmet feeding on exotic dishes, you know. <laughs> Which, which does describe, I would say, probably 98% of us. The, the vast majority of us in America, even at, now, raise your hand if you think you're broke. Let me get a witness. <laughs> say, say amen if you think you're broke. Amen. You see, amen, amen. Now, that's relative. That's comparative. You say, broke in America is not like broke in the rest of the world. This is gourmet feeding on exotic dishes. What does that look like? Burger King. <laughs> Five guys, Chipotle, some home-cooked meal, whatever. It's like, you know, the, it's, these things are full of fat, full of salt, and full of sugar. That's why they taste so good, amen? You say, oh, they're calorie-rich but nutritious. You know, the only reason why we talk about stuff like that is because we overconsume it. That stuff is awesome. Are you with me? If we fed that to the rest of the world, they'd be like, yeah, thank you. That's awesome. I need some calories. A double cheeseburger with bacon sounds like, like survival. But because we eat, we don't, you know, so, so we have this conviction. Because here's my reality, okay? I, you know, sadly, it's sad to say, and I don't think I'm alone, I don't eat to live, I live to eat. Wow. Eating has is, is become entertainment. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm bored, go eat. I'm sad, go eat. I'm happy, twisty treat, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, become, it's become celebratory, it's ridiculous. I went to Twisty Treat last week. Uh -oh. it, they gave me an affogato. I don't know. I didn't ask for it. They just gave it. I'm just kidding. It's like, who's this? Yo? Oh, you want my money? All right, here you go. It's literally a giant cup full of soft serve ice cream that has espresso poured all over it. I'm like, who, 
Who invented this? This is the greatest thing I've ever experienced in my life. That is not sin. Amen? To overconsume it may be, but it's not bad to eat those things. But you say, okay, well, what's the issue? The gourmet feeding on exotic. He ate awesome every day. And he walked by Lazarus time and time again, who had nothing. And you know, Lazarus, his name in the Latin version is Eleazar, which means God is my help. So Lazarus was reliant totally on God to survive. And he ate the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. He was desperate. Now, they both died. The rich man's in hell. Lazarus is in paradise. And you know, obviously this deals with greed, but there's a deeper issue at hand. The rich man's greatest sin was not necessarily his greed, but the fact that he was able to help, but he didn't. And he walked by day after day after day, said nothing, did nothing. Proverbs 24 says, If you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? You know, the rich man, day after day, simply ignored the need that Lazarus had. And we can be like that. Now, as disciples, we got to understand that our greatest sin is not necessarily what we, what we do, but oftentimes what we don't do. Consider, for example, the great characters of the Old Testament. Noah was a drunkard, yet the Bible says he was righteous. Abraham sold his wife out, not once, twice, yet he's the father of faith for three religions. Gideon had next to no faith, yet God used him to conquer a nation. David was an adulterer and a murderer, yet he was a man after God's own heart. Our greatest sin is not always what we do, but what we omit, what we don't do. Do you accept that your neighbor is not right with God and you don't act? Do you accept that your family is not right with God and you're not willing to rock the boat and make things uncomfortable to help them to see the truth? You know, if you've accepted these things, you are that rich person. You're that rich man. You live in the luxuries of God every day. You, we, we have a gourmet feast every Sunday, amen? amen? And every other Wednesday night, you know, we get together. The guys get together on one Wednesday. The sisters are getting together this Wednesday. And we have Bible talk. You have, you have all these ways of, of being nourished spiritually. Our job is not to, to live in that luxury alone, but to get as many people to come as possible. We are simply beggars that have found bread, trying to show other beggars where the bread is. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, it's... it's, it's absolute torture to be in hell one of the greatest lies that the christian world has propagated the, the what let's call it not christianity but churchianity is that hell is just this temporary place and and you go there and then after you're there for a bit you just kind of stop existing but the reality is that hell is eternal and it's full of fire it's the lake of burning sulfur if you take if you take the the, the fire out of hell if you take the sting out of death the punishment out of disobedience, you then empty the cross of its power. So if hell isn't that bad, well, heaven must not be that good. So why not just keep doing what you're doing? It's a lie from Satan. You know, when we come to church, our value system starts to change. When we study the Bible, there's a paradigm shift that starts to happen, and, and that can kind of rock your world, but you need it, amen, and so do I. On April 14th in 1912, at 10 p.m., the Titanic crashed into a huge iceberg. And there's a woman, the story goes that she had a few minutes to run back to her room and gather some, some possessions and some things that she considered to be of value. So she bolts past the casino and, and all of the cash boxes that had been totally vacated. Once the ship started to go down, she went to her room, and the only thing she grabbed was three oranges for survival. You see, these super wealthy people who had all this stuff, when the Titanic was sinking, none of it mattered. That's right. And the only thing that mattered was survival. When you're facing death, your value system starts to change. And you know, this rich guy, when he's in hell, after his death, his value system changes. He now values what God values. He said, will you send somebody, please, to preach to my family? I don't want them to come and be where I am. 
He says, well, send Lazarus because if Lazarus goes, they'll listen. He's risen from the dead. Of, of course they'll listen. And Abraham says, if they don't listen to the word of God, they'll not listen even if somebody rises from the dead. Wow. And of course, that's an allusion to Jesus Christ. You know, the most powerful thing we have in the world is the word of God. The Old Testament calls it a hammer. The New Testament calls it a sword. You know, it's so incredible is that some of us, when we, we study the Bible, we're, we're kind of like, we're just pagans, you know. We're just in a lot of sin. And we need a hammer to deal with us, don't we? Yeah. Amen? You say, I, I needed a hammer. I was just like, just hit, hit me, man, you know. Uh, Corey needed a hammer. I mean, he just needed, like, the guy was in sin. He needed to get hit. But you say, there's, when you're religious, you need something a bit more precise, a bit more cutting. You need that sword to deal with you. To teach us, to give us perspective that our greatest sin is not always what we do, but oftentimes what we don't do. Point number three, a grateful heart. Go to Luke 17, verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. You know, leprosy is an intense disease. The Bible here, what it refers to as leprosy is either, you know, what we understand to be leprosy today or some other infectious skin disease. And in Numbers 5, it says that these people were to be isolated because it was so contagious that they needed to be apart from the camp until they were healed. Leviticus chapter 14, turn there with me if you will, lays out what needs to happen with those that have leprosy. Jesus heals these guys and then tells, him, tells them to go to the priest and show themselves. In Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, These are the regulations for the diseased person at the time of his ceremonial cleansing. When he is brought to the priest, the priest is to go outside the camp and examine him. If the person has been healed of his infectious disease, the priest shall order that two live clean birds and some cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the one to be cleansed. Then the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed over fresh water in a clay pot. He is then to take the live bird and dip it together with the cedar wood and scarlet yarn and the hyssop into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. Seven times he shall sprinkle the one to be cleansed of the infectious disease and pronounce him clean. Then he is to release the live bird into the open fields. You know, it's incredible here because it lays out what's supposed to happen with those that have been cleansed from their infectious skin disease. It says two birds are to be brought. One bird, they literally take the dove and wring its neck until it snaps, and they empty the blood into a clay jar filled with water. And it says there's cedar wood, and there's hyssop, and there's scarlet yarn. And then that other bird is dipped into that water that's mixed with blood and then released and freed after that. Now, of course, this is symbolic of what happened to us when we were baptized. This is that, that innocent dove, that, that, that pure sacrifice. Jesus was ringed and abused and beaten and his blood was poured out. And it says that we came, and think of the other articles that are in action here. Cedar wood reminds of us of the cross. Scarlet yarn, which is red, which represents the blood that was spilled. Hyssop, which is a cleansing agent. It's also the staff that they put the sponge on to feed to Jesus as he was on the cross. And it says that we were baptized, and we made contact with the blood of Jesus. Jesus paid the price, and we were freed and released also being healed of our own infectious disease, sin. Amen. You know, it's awesome because today, Ralph is going to be healed. Ralph is going to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. You say, well, well what's baptism? It's the participation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. Basically, what you're saying is you study the Bible 
And it's, it's not a series of negotiations, like how much of your life do you want to keep and how much of your life are we willing to accept? No, you're saying, hey, I've had enough of this life. I want to die. I don't want to live this life anymore. The life that I have, I want to live entirely, 100% for Jesus. It says you, you sign over your life. You give the keys to your life to Jesus to let him then determine and dictate terms. The cool thing is that when you become a disciple, your life is awesome. Amen? Amen. And God gives you so much to be thankful for and so much to be grateful for. You say, when you're baptized, and it was so awesome seeing David get baptized last Sunday. And, and he's already doing the contribution talk here today. And we've got to remember what this is all about. And, and when we're in a moment of distress and we're having a bad day, when we're having a bad moment, we've got to remember what God has done for us and be ever grateful for our salvation. You know, there's no excuse for a disciple to be discouraged. Amen? You know, today I, I got in a lift to get to church, and I had everything set up, and I put my little pen in my coat, and I was like, I'm ready to go, you know. Had my sunglasses, had my, uh, you know, I was, I was good. And then, like, halfway to church, I was like, no, I forgot the communion trays. I forgot the communion cups. I forgot the envelopes. I was just like, why? There's always something. It's like, well, this is silly. I mean, at the end of the day, amen, if I have to turn around and go get it, I'll get it. And thanks be to God, my wife brought all that stuff, amen? I say, there's, there's no reason for us to be discouraged, but it's insignificant things that oftentimes can throw us for a loop. I mean, we can spend years in bitterness, decades. We can waste so much time thinking about how bad life has been and how things have gone wrong, while in reality, you've forgotten that you've been saved. Amen? When you lose your gratitude for your salvation, you lose your motivation. And it's time for us to remember. And it's time for us to recall the values of God and to know what the values of God are. Faithful stewardship, a benevolent spirit, and a grateful heart. Amen? To God be the glory.